tonight we are honored to have Analia Saban with us for a very special Tuesday evening's presentation. Analia is, of course, the artist featured in the Modern's upcoming and final focus exhibition of the 2018-2019 season, Focus Analia Saban, which is curated by Allison Hurst and which opens to the public. Um, I'm saying this coming weekend, but I think it might be a little earlier than that. Is, there, is it open on Friday? It's open on Friday. So um, I have to say, um, I got a sneak peek, um, one of the perks of working here, and it is gorgeous. It is such a beautiful show. Um, Analia is um, an ambitious artist who challenges the traditions of art um, as she dissects, reconfigures, recycles, repurposes, and exploits disciplines, forms, and materials to test the boundaries of painting and beyond. Born in Buenos Aires um, with a BFA from Loyola um, University in New Orleans and an MFA from um, UCLA, uh, Analia now lives and works in Los Angeles. Her intellectual rigor and insatiable exploration of material limits um, has resulted in a wide range of works that have brought her international recognition and praise. Represented by Spruth Mogger's Gallery in Berlin, also LA and London, um, and Tanya Benachter uh, Gallery um, in LA and, and New York, uh, Analia's false show, um, and um, Tanya Benachter's, why does that one give me so much trouble? Um, New York location, punched card. Um, touched on some of the same themes that will be found in the Modern's upcoming exhibition. And in that upcoming show, um, if not already aware, you will soon note that Analia's work is stunningly beautiful with just the right measure of irreverence. Um, it is no surprise that her exhibition record spans the globe from uh, Shanghai and Berlin to Houston and now Fort Worth um, and that her work is, has landed in significant public and private collections, including the um, Hammer Museum, LA MOCA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, as well as Hassel Museum of Art at Bard College in New York, and the Center Pompidou in Paris. All to say, we are most fortunate to have Analia Saban here tonight to share her work and ideas with us as a preview and to provide insight into Focus Analia Saban. If you will, please join me in a warm welcome and a show of appreciation for Analia Saban. Hey, thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you to Alison Hurst for inviting me to be in the show. And uh, it's quite an honor to be showing here in this very beautiful museum, um, such a perfect context of materials and architecture. I couldn't ask for more uh, to show my work. So it's really a pleasure. Um, I'm going to show you just kind of a chronology of maybe how I got to this show. Uh, it's been about 15 years since I've been, I would say, working professionally uh, since I finished school and I've been doing this. And uh, it's gone through different moments. So I hope to share the process and how I got to this one exhibition that I'm very happy to share with you. Um, so this is uh, the first work I did that I was kind of okay with. You know, as an artist, you struggle a lot for a while, and then finally you hit something that you're like, okay, this is something that I want to explore more. And basically, my background was in filmmaking, in video. So I came to art, well, I came to the States to study film, and then when I was in school, I didn't like it so much. It was very commercially oriented. They were teaching me how to basically make a film that would make money and not a good film. And it was all about time is money and production and you know formulas and so on. So then I was doing a minor in art and when I switched to art, it was really like one of the happiest days of my life. I didn't know what I was getting into or how would I survive or anything, but I knew I had found my calling. Um, but this is the moment where 
This is a very early work from 2004, but I felt it was the moment where my two worlds collided and, and it was what I wanted to do from now on. And it's basically a little short commercial. It's like 30 second video, but it's printed frame by frame. So it's basically 900 images. And I thought it would be interesting to show video in a different way. We're used to looking at video on TV. So I thought, what if we print frame by frame, what would happen? So that's what happens. You get this much paper or this many pictures in only 30 seconds. And also it was interesting to, you know, make a very abstract cube in a way. And then I could also see the sequence on the edge of the paper. So the prints were printed to the edge. Very simple thing I did on my printer, nothing fancy in terms of production. And you could see how the paper was bleeding to the edge and you can see the movement and basically a different type of abstraction of that video. And after that, because I was in art and I was in a very uh, strong painting department at UCLA, I was asking myself, you know, why was painting so important and why was art so important? So I was kind of looking for answers. I started to like break it apart and, and it was a way of trying to understand it deeper and to see, okay, like what is a painting? A painting is, you know, a work that we look at it, it's on the wall, it's a two dimensional uh, work of art. But if you look at it closely, it's an object. It's made out of fabric and it has pigment on it. And then when I was able to open it, then I had a huge pile of thread. I didn't know what to do with it. So once, you know, what do you do with like a huge pile of thread so it doesn't get all entangled? You like turn it into a ball. So I made that little ball and the ball became bigger. And that's about three, um, 100 paintings from all different sources, so portraits, landscapes. And it was also a very interesting way of um, collecting, <laughs> because I had to collect enough paintings for that piece to have you know, uh, presence in the room, like a sculpture. So I needed about 100 paintings, and it was an interesting way of tapping into all the histories of painting. So for that, I went to um, artist studios. I asked my, 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 um, my co-students or my, the, my, my friends at the school to give me some of their paintings that they didn't want anymore. I asked, uh, I went to thrift stores and I saw Sunday painters, as they call it, people who would paint in their garage and had like a whole pile of paintings. I went to uh, a place where they sold paintings made in China, where they reproduce this, the same painting over and over again, just because people like to have, even if it's a reproduction, but it's a very beautiful Van Gogh or a Dali. So I had like many reproductions there uh, made in China and so on. So it was really an interesting way of understanding all the different practices surrounded uh, around painting. And there's a close up where you see still like the pigments that are attached to it. And then I went on to, in this case, Reknit some of them. So in this case, it's 10 different paintings that I took apart and then I remade. So you can see where one painting ends and the other one begins. And that's kind of similar to the first piece I showed you. So I thought it was interesting to see that connection. You see a detail. And then uh, a three paintings that became a scarf. So this was just, you know, in case sometimes you're, war you're cold and you need to wear something. So I was like, okay, you can take the painting from the wall, put it back together and wear it. And this was a landscape. One of them, the, the biggest painting was a landscape. So you can still see the green and the blue colors of the landscape. And then thinking a bit more about art, I was also thinking about modernism and the fact that there is so much that's already been made and also, you know, coming from the history of the ready-made. So it was really like trying to find my way as a student and trying to understand art through making it. So that was part of the idea. So I was studying a lot, doing a lot of research and also like trying to make works so I could have a deeper understanding of 
what we're dealing with in terms of art. So I took um, Kandinsky as an example, and I took three different lines and I reproduced them. I copied them very carefully, just in the computer, and then I was able to uh, take three different lines and make them in all different sizes to basically build a vocabulary of art. And then these were in cardboard, and I took the lines, I covered them in graphite, and then I made these compositions using all different ready-made lines by different artists. So really trying to like come up with some type of vocabulary that I could use. And then I wrote the names of the artists. And I did the same process applied to painting. So the previous one was just cardboard with graphite on it. In this case, it's canvas with acrylic paint on it. And they were basically like Lego blocks because they were primary and secondary colors and by all different artists. And then I glue all the pieces together and it was quite like a tapestry collage of all these ready-made pieces. And again, trying to understand, so what is a painting? It's also, it's this um, fabric material with pigment on it and it's also um, brush strokes and there is a lot of a lot that's happening it's a performance of the hand moving from A to B making all these different brush strokes so in this case I just bought a few paintings and I was just tracing and trying to understand and in a way it wasn't about destruction of painting but really to like value what's in there so to understand that the painting is this huge group of brush strokes and there is a lot that goes on in moving the hand from the paint to the canvas and the pressure of the brush and the thickness of the brushes and the thickness of the paint and to really understand all the components that go in a painting. And once I understood that I could take things apart, I was also looking a lot about, at the different uh, materials that make a painting. So a painting can be anything, really. It can be uh, early on, they were using carbon, uh, like cave paintings. Uh, then they used wax-based painting. That's a very early type of paint, which is just uh, beeswax, resin from trees, and some pigment, and you work on it while it's warm as a soup, and then you can paint with it, and it's very archival because it's called, it's, the pigment is uh, covered with the wax and it lasts kind of forever. This is like Pompeii times. And then uh, we have oil paint, and that was also a bunch of different materials in the oil. It could be eggshells, it could be uh, plants, it could be rocks, I mean, it could be all different materials. So the history of painting, it's quite uh, incredible in that you can see so much in the different pigments. And then we have acrylic paint, which is the paint that we use nowadays. I mean, most common paint or most affordable paint, more synthetic paints, they come in all different colors and so on. And then I realized that acrylic paint, it's basically a polymer, so it's quite it's just a plastic. And if, because if it, it's a plastic, I didn't need to really paint it on the canvas anymore, but I could just attach it in different ways because it doesn't need a support. It's basically a plastic that once it's dry, you can just hold it in your hand and it's a little sculpture and you don't need anything else. But as a gesture, I just thought I would, you know, attach it to the canvas in different ways. So I use tape and thread, and then separating it completely from the canvas. Then I did this show, this was in Paris, and it was all about gravity, so I thought it'd be interesting, just as a gesture to really separate the images from their support, to separate the lines from the support. So um, in this case, I cut all the lines from a Sol Lewitt drawing, I cut them with a laser cutter to be very precise and not to change his own gesture. And then they um, 
So they were all attached. I mean, they were not attached. They were, you know, drawn on this paper. I did a reproduction, and then I cut them all out. So you you see holes here, and then they all fell, of course, to the floor. This is the frame, and it's on the floor of the frame. So it's this pile of lines, and of course the work shifts when it's moved and it changes, and then it's like a sculpture inside. And this was also part of my exploration to like try to learn about art in a way. So this is a still, we're still like in 2007 here. And it was interesting to tap into different artists. So Sol LeWitt versus Ellsworth Kelly versus Albers, because then each composition gave me a different weight of line. It, I felt that I was understanding lines and 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 um, compositions and structures in different ways, depending on the artist. And then I became interested in containing that line and whether the line could actually transcend the canvas or whether it could exist just like the acrylic paint that could like exist away from the canvas. I was wondering if there were other ways of containing that line and maybe make it, making it transcend from the canvas. So in this case, you have this line. This is actually oil, and it's, um, it's all contained in a big plastic bag. It's vacuum sealed, so it, then there is no air, so it, the paint can't really move anywhere. But there is this line, and it goes on the canvas, and then it like it continues off the canvas. And somehow that was an important moment <laughs> for me to understand that there was this transcendence and one thing could exist away from the other. And again, so the line goes on top of the little canvas and then it continues. And more of this type of exploration where it could completely come out. And once I understood that, I realized that I could actually build objects that were just made with paint. So in this case, this is um, a towel. And it's basically, I used the same sculptural process that you would use to make a sculpture. So there was a real towel and I made a mold a silicone mold, and then instead of pouring plaster on the mold, I pour acrylic paint, and then I was able to peel the towel, the paint from the mold, and then just hold this object made out of acrylic paint, and then hold, and then I hang it. So instead of like, you know, paint it or something, I just hang it from the top of the canvas. And I felt it was kind of an interesting moment because it's like, um, like who would make a sculpture of something so two-dimensional as a towel, but then it's also like a three-dimensional object, and then it's also dealing with absorbing water, and the paint is wet, and there were all these like different implications that I liked to think about. And then the idea that acrylic paint, it's a plastic, and so it's a plastic bag. There are like two different types of polymer, so, so um, and of course, there is commerce surrounded by paint, so by around painting. So, this is just a little canvas that's inside this acrylic paint plastic bag, and more of a trash bag situation, which was actually very hard to make because to cast a knot of a plastic bag. For those of you who know mold making, it's really hard because it has all these different parts of the mold and so on. So it was really, uh, looks simple, but it took like six months to make. And then another thing I think about when I think about paint is the more organic parts of the paint. So this is a piece where um, it's oil paint and all I did was I stretch the canvas. It's the same, the same uh, vocabulary that you would use for any any canvas. You would get a piece of, in this case, linen canvas. So you could see this is like linen canvas, which is a very traditional material uh, when it comes to painting. And then on one side, I primed it with plaster. This is very traditional practice. And then you have the stretcher bars. And the only difference is that I stretched it really, really loose. 
So that was able to build this cavity. And then inside, I poured all this paint. <coughs> so this is oil paint and the dimensions, it's called trough, and the dimensions of it are, so the width is my height, and then inside there are 125 pounds of paint, which is my body weight in paint. And it's basically my body in paint. And it's a good thing that it's still wet, just like me, and hopefully it will stay wet for as long as I live because oil takes a really long time to dry, especially if it's so thick. So there is this connection about you know, the body. I mean, there is, that's kind of another hypothesis that I have in terms of why is painting sometimes more important than let's say a photograph or people, people somehow there is a bodily connection. Not that the photograph is not important, but I feel like there is something about the painting and surface that we react to it. And in my experience, people react to surface and it's just a very interesting phenomenon that happens. And I think it's, there is more of a body uh, relationship that we can connect with. And then um, thinking about, so there is always this idea of like, painting, sculpture, whether it was something like the same way I was able to cast an object and use the sculptural process for something, I was asking myself whether I could carve a painting. So in this case, I used um, a laser machine to carve the surface of a painting. And it was just a very simple process where I left this section untouched and then it has more and more carving power until here, and it's basically, the laser is basically a beam of fire, and just with heat, it's removing material, and at the end, you see how it almost disintegrates. And once I did very, this very basic um, carving sample, I realized that I could actually carve it, kind of like you carve a piece of marble. So in this case, I left these cubes untouched, and then I, I relied on you know, this idea of perspective drawing. So all the lines are also untouched, trying to hold the cubes together, and everything else is carved out. So you can see how you know, the lines are holding the piece and everything else could fall um, because it had that same, same idea of like removing material to something more extreme where the lines were just holding this very simple staircase and everything else was almost gone. And this is how I got to uh, working with circuit boards because I thought it would be like a very interesting type of structure um, that had many things that I was very interested in. It had, uh, I could, carve it and I still keep a sense of structure because things were all connected together. And then I was always very interested in this idea of a painting as a system, a system of thinking. So a system where like you have the brush strokes, you have the thinking of the object, you have the history behind it. So you have this system around the painting. And I thought this type of um, subject matter was basically saying many of the things that I was thinking about at the moment. And this is just an imaginary circuit board, uh, but it's still connected with many of the things that I was interested about. And then I was thinking more about different materials and what if I apply the same type of carving to a piece of wood. And I thought it was interesting because you see the grain of the wood and how the different, so if the laser is carving, uh, let's say at like 90% power in the whole surface, it's still some areas were carving more than others because of the grain of the wood. So I thought that was interesting because it was the, uh, it, they were two different systems meeting at the same time. On the one hand, my drawing that was, 
uh, you know, being processed through this laser power. And then on the other hand, it was the actual nature of the wood. And then both of them together were like creating this result. So it was like a very organic and a very mechanical machine made um, process and how both together were producing this drawing. And this is another example. <coughs> So I think what I'm trying to get to is to the point that like uh, when I work, I work in all different mediums I have in my studio. I like that conversation between very new technology like a laser machine and very old technology like a or maybe not, I mean, not even technology, like just nature, like a piece of wood. And then I have, I think about carving. So we do like marble carvings and we do, um, I also have a dark room. And I think like there is some a very interesting conversation that happens when you put like different times, different techniques together and just to see what happens. So I wanna briefly show you some photographs and then you will see hopefully how everything connected and how this um, journey of technology and uh, research on materials came together in the show um, that's here. So this is a bit of a side project, but um, also about the line. So I had my dark room and I was working, thinking a lot about, you know, what can be done with the dark room that can't be done with computers. So basically dark room photography after Photoshop. Is there anything I can do in the dark room that I can't do in the computer? And there were many things. One is to use light as an object. Another thing, so photograms. Another thing is to really play with the material itself to, that makes the photograph. So in this case, I was uh, separating the emulsion from the paper, so uh, scra scraping away the actual emulsion of the photograph, and then I was pushing it down onto this horizon line, so making a kind of an abstraction of everything that was here before, and pushing it with a knife down to the horizon line, and then I left this little corner for the bird, but overall it was abstracting it. This was just turning this very kind of traditional family photograph into these lines that were kind of taken by the wind. And thinking about, this is something that actually was really great because I could work in my studio and I could do the whole work in one night. I could take a photograph, develop it, and then, you know, experiment in the dark room with the process and then it was done. And it was kind of like a complex process of printing, but thanks to dark room photography, you can actually just do it all together in maybe a session of eight hours or so. So in this case, I wanted to think about the skin of my arm and the skin of the image. So it's a photograph that I just took of my arm and then I printed it and then it was like, lifting the skin of the photograph. It was also like scraping my skin. And this is a photograph of the studio that I could actually also do in the same evening, just to take it, develop it, and trying to abstract this whole section into this one line. And then going back to the line that I showed you before in that plastic bag, this was a similar idea where the line also transcended. So in this side, I was able to lift this whole thing and push it up into this line. And then I realized, same as with the acrylic paint, that I could actually lift it and then use the same material, so kind of push it forward. It's basically like, I don't know, like a, like a bad quality bubble gum, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you can like, um, once you lift it from the paper, you can actually stretch it a little bit and then this is a canvas on the other side. And for me that was important because it went back to thinking about the history of painting, that paint can be basically anything and maybe I could just make a line, make a gesture that was holding all this information into here. And it was thinking about, you know, what is a pigment? So a pigment can be eggshells, it can be uh, rocks, it can be this and that. And in this case, a pigment can be the emulsion from the photograph that went onto the canvas and it made a line that was holding this information. 
And same idea with this one. So this is my face, like a selfie, but with a 35 millimeter camera, which is not so easy to do. And the line was basically the abstraction of it, and it went down onto this canvas material. So I really wanted to make that connection between painting and photography. And moving forward, I got a loom. Uh, I was doing one year of research at the Getty Research Institute, and it was really a great year for me because uh, it's basically every year they invite one artist and they have a theme project. So they have um, mostly art historians and theory, uh, I would say theory people, uh, and then they invite one artist. But the theme is in common for everyone. So the, the topic of the year was materials, art materials. So I felt it was just very exciting to be in this environment for a year and to learn so much from my co-fellows. And I got this loom from one of the art historians who was a resident and lived in Scotland, and she couldn't take the loom back to Scotland. So she said, what do I do? And I'm like, I think you have to like drop it off at my studio <laughs> and just leave it there. And then I, I gave her a small work that she could actually take in her handbag, and I got the loom. And I had the loom for about six months. I really didn't know what to do with it, but it was a very beautiful object to look at. And then I realized that I could actually weave my own canvas, which is very, um, it sounds very counterproductive, but it gave me a lot of control on many things. And once I understood that if I could go back to weaving canvas, I had so many options, uh, a lot of things opened up. And one of the ideas I had was that the same way that I could hold acrylic paint in my hands, I could maybe change the order of things. So if we're very used to painting on canvas, I could actually weave the acrylic paint through the canvas. So that's what I started doing. And in this case, I was making the paint on these huge tables to make these very long brush strokes, and then weaving the paint through the canvas. So this is the result. And much bigger scale. This is about maybe 80 by 45 inches. Here you see a close up. And on the other side, I was thinking again about materials and the fact that the same way that we're so used to, and you know, there is a lot of tradition that I want to contest because there is a lot of tradition that's just like I go to the art store, and this is something that. I like to discuss with students because usually you go to the art store and you say, okay, I want to make a painting and you buy the materials, you buy the canvas that's there in stock and you buy the paint that's there in stock and I think it's very important to think about why, uh, why we're doing this and it's really just automatic uh, tradition that we need to maybe slow down and think about why or how did we get to use that material and not that material. And something that was, I was also interested in is in the idea that we use ink on paper. So I wanted to just see if the ink, which is very different than the paint, it's oil-based ink that's used for printmaking, whether I could also like rethink the way it was used. So in this case, it's just a layer of ink that because I was using it very thick, it started sh shrinking and made this pattern. And then kind of by accident, I started thinking that if I put paper on top, so changing the order, instead of doing ink on paper, to do paper on ink, uh, once I started doing that, I could kind of see that depending on how much space there was to, to let the ink dry, so I put the paper while the ink is very wet and it's applied very thick. It's usually ink that's mostly for newspapers and printmaking, so it's supposed to be used very thin, but in this case it's used much thicker. So it takes a bit of time to dry, but then I realized that once they, it had like a pattern, it could like 
dry according to the pattern. So for instance, like this is a good example where you see this like very fine lines of paper. This is also cut in my laser cutter to have that type of precision. And the paper is also carved, just like I did with the paintings. So in a way, you have different levels of thickness in that sheet of paper all the way to nothing and maybe like 60%, I mean, 60% painting, 40% carved, all the way to maybe only having 10% of paper left in here. And then once you see how, like the ink, for instance, between these two lines, it was contained, and then I, I started seeing that the ink was reacting and drying in different patterns based on how much space there was for it. So in this case, it make all these little lines, or in this case, it made also these smaller compositions. And then in the bigger sections, it made much bigger kind of just organic, random um, patterns. So that was interesting. And then I left it there. So many things kind of happened in the studio at the same time. So I had the weavings going, and then the looking at paint and just observing it for a long time. And then I started thinking about circuit boards and seeing whether I could kind of put everything together. And this is where I will show you a little bit of the show, just a preview, but I hope you go see it in person because it's a little bit more fun than the slides, I hope. And uh, so for this show, I bought an actual jacquard loom and I got I got very interested, so I was doing the jacquard, I had a normal loom, and then I had all these experiment, experiments going, and then I always been very interested in technology and the history of computers, because I was doing these circuit boards. I was taking computer science classes during my MFA, so fine arts, but also like going to the engineering department just to have something else to think about. And then, it's kind of like everything came together, like all my passions into this show that I'm showing here. So this is basically a tapestry. Uh, it's based on a circuit board, which is the first optical mouse. And it's a tapestry. I forgot the size, but it's about 72 inches wide by, I don't know, like probably over hand, around 100 inches. and. It's that same process of weaving the paint through the canvas. And something that was very important to me is that when I was researching weaving, I realized that there was a moment in time where like, they, uh, the computer industry needed to record information and into punch cards, as you know, like that was for the first census, IBM need some punch cards to be able to record information. And the way they got to the punch cards was through the weaving industry, because the weaving industry had done this for many, many years before computers. They, if they had to reproduce a pattern and copy it from one loom to the other, they had a system of punch cards, and they would have one punch card for each line. So for each uh, horizontal line, there was a cardboard thing with holes in it, and that would go into the loom, and it would determine which threads to lift in order to make a pattern. And once you had a huge pile of um, punch cards, you could take that pile from one loom in Belgium or in England to another loom in France and copy the same pattern over and over. And this had been going on for many, many years. And then once they needed to record information for the first IBM computers, they borrowed that technology from the textile industry, which I thought was quite fascinating. So I did, I focused on that for this show. So there you see, for the show I bought a jacquard loom, which is basically like a more contemporary version of the punch card loom, but it's the same idea, just that instead of punch cards, now I have a computer that makes it easier. And I made this piece, so this is, um, this is just a pattern. I tapped into kind of milestones for computer industry. So in this case, it's the first optical mouse. I did other works about um, first Intel processors. Uh, most circuit boards are between 1950 and 1960, because these are like the moment that the computer was really being born. 
And if you look at circuit boards, they're also like weavings because you're trying to connect all the information together. You're trying to weave, connect things together. And once I wove, I did the weaving of one of them, I realized that they also look like tapestries in a way. So it was just this very kind of um, this connection that came from all different angles. And you see a detail here. And in this case, this is similar to the little um, interior that I showed you, but this is the same circuit board. It's paper on the ink, but with much more detail, much bigger. And then here is how the patterns of the ink and the circuit board, which is this cutout of paper, uh, happen. So in this case, you see how like it's almost like this organic intelligence, I call it, but um, the ink started reacting to the holes of the paper and it really made these very interesting patterns. So where there were circles, it pulled into circles, and then where there were squares, it made, I don't know, this looked like ears or something, but it's just trying to adapt to how much space there is for it to dry. Um, so I thought it was interesting to connect those two materials together, just like the wood, but in this case, it's um, the very precise, very mechanical, high-tech cutting of paper with a very imprecise organic material of the ink, and just to see how those two would interact. So when I make them, I make, uh, I pour the ink on this huge panels, it's a wooden panel, it's all happening horizontal, it's a very thick layer of ink, and then there is a paper cutout that goes on top, and, and then it dries for about six to nine months, and that's when all the shrinkage happens. There is another detail. And then another very happy accident was that I was working on this body of work when Alison Hurst came to my studio and I was showing her what I was working on and then she offered me the show and it happens to be here in Texas, which is you know, a huge uh, place for the birth of the uh, integrated circuit and the semiconductor. Texas Instruments and um, many companies that made huge leaps into the semiconductor. So this is also like a very special work that kind of came together for the show. So here you can see my loom. So this is the jacquard loom. And you can see here, it's quite complex in that there is an actual circuit board in each of these things and each circuit board has a cable, and then these are like metal, I don't know how you call them, metal threads in a way that can lift each thread individually. So the, the back of the loom from here to the end, it's all computer, and then the front of the loom from here to here, it's hand woven. So that's the same kind of dialogue that I always wanted to have between the handmade and the computers I found in this tool. And in this case, I thought it'd be interested because I was working with circuit boards and computers and so on, I thought it'd be interested that uh, I could actually weave with copper threads, so a very conductive material from the electrical industry. And so this is how these works started. So you see the copper thread, and then on the warp, you see the linen, which is basically this very traditional material of linen canvas. And then on the weft, it's just the copper. And it's all woven slowly through. And here's the detail. And another detail. And this is a semiconductor circuit board produced here in Dallas. And it's also in the show, so I hope you get to see it. And that's basically how I came to this moment in time. We'll see what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. <laughs> and we have a few minutes if anyone has a question. Could you talk about the um, the element of time in your work? I'm really struck by, you know, to see these things finish kind of leaves out just when you said that they, they dry for six to nine months. I feel like that's just part of your your practice is time. It's, can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a nice, very philosophical question, which I like. Um, so there is a lot of time, and there is also a lot of time related to materials that I like to think about. I mean, one of my projects, why I decided to go to the Getty was because I was so interested in conservation. And I thought that maybe time could be a material in, in itself. So to paint with aging, for instance. So there were, they have these aging machines, as they call them. And so you can put the material and basically a minute of the machine is the equivalent of maybe like a week in a museum environment. So it's heated with very strong light and very strong temperature, and you can see the, the material changing uh, faster. So it's kind of like there is trying to speed up time to see how the material would react. So that's always been very interested, uh, very interesting topic. And then I also think about materials like the painting bag which is made out of oil, and it will probably take at least 50 more years to dry, uh, versus a piece of marble, which is already like set, and it took so many years to be made by the earth. But it's something that we tend to use for gravestones or something more permanent. Uh, so I think materials do have like so much in them uh, in terms of what they mean to us. Um, I was thinking a lot, something that I forgot to mention was the history of textiles, and that's something that um, only recently, because you know, when you're young, you think that all your ideas are yours, and that you're totally in a vacuum, and you're so creative, and then I realized that I come from like, you know, a Middle Eastern Jewish family that did textiles forever. <laughs> and like, I was like, oh. Maybe that was an influence. <laughs> and now I'm weaving in my studio. I was like, ah. Um, anyway, and then like uh, something that I did recently, uh, I had a show in Shanghai last year. And as a treat, I asked them to take me to a textile factory. And we went to this factory just an hour from Shanghai. And it was a factory that produces um, like like Zara is like one of the main clients and they produce something like 200 kilometers of fabric per day. And it was, you know, you have this idea of China and you think, oh, there will be so many workers. And then we go in and it's a huge campus. It's a huge, huge factory. And in the whole time I was there, maybe I saw only 12 employees and everything else was robotics. And the speed of the looms were so fast, the way they were weaving, all synthetic, so all plastic uh, made, but it's basically the, the clothes we wear. And, and it was actually very scary because they were very loud and they were one next to the other. The sound was like really, really a lot. It's like being next to a, a turbine at the next to an airplane. And, and the same idea, they were going so fast that you know, if any hair, anything goes in the wrong spot, it can actually kill you. So you have to be so careful because it's going really, really fast. And, and I was like, oh my God, that's, that's fabric nowadays. It's done at that speed and it's produced at that speed. And then therefore it tends to be very affordable. And then we consume it nonstop. And that's such a symbol of what's going on. So. I think of time a lot and how materials carry this information. And I, I'm trying to you know, slow down and be like, OK, wait, how is this made? Why did we get to this point? How did we get to this point? And through the work, um, through the history of art and painting, 
through the history of machines. They're all things that I'm trying to talk about through my work. Please. I have one question. I'd like to know what was your preference as to types of inks, uh, namely plant or animal origin, and what, how dense did, dense did you prefer to have your inks? You know, you caught me here because I didn't think about whether it's carbon-based or more like petroleum-based on this particular on this particular pro project. And I will look back and I will think about. I will like look back and try to think about it. But normally, I do know much more about the formulas. This one in particular, I don't. Uh, but that should also be a big part of it. I mean, like animal products in art, like, you know, I was thinking the other day I had to talk at the Museum of Israel and then it was, I was thinking a lot about calf, calf skin and how, you know, all the writings, all the scrolls are made on calf and rabbit skin glue. I mean, it's very interesting how animals play such an important role and I think about it, but this thing in particular, I need to look back whether it's more like petroleum-based, carbon, or, yeah, so, good question. <laughs> Anything else? So your marble pieces, which you didn't include here, but the ones that you draped over the saw horses, where you treated marble like fabric. Yeah. Where did that come in your chronology? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I was uh, discussing this earlier. My work has become a bit big to talk about in 45 minutes, so I had to summarize it. Uh, but it's, in a way, it's all, it's just another branch of the same idea. I mean, in that case, which you can see a work at Rajovsky uh, that's installed now, and it's one of the marble, folded marble pieces. It's also about the history of uh, art in that you know, it's called drape marble, the piece, and there is a whole history of drapery in marble, and this whole idea of, you know, the human hand trying to make that drape, right? And 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 I thought, well, what's my take on drapery? I'm not a Renaissance master, you know. What? How would I approach the same subject now? And so. I, I had to break the marble and then drape it, and I wish I had a photo, but uh, it's hopefully easy to find. But I, it's also rethinking a material, trying to see if the same way that changing the order, in that case, can I turn something so hard as marble into something flexible and have that same uh, connection? And then, in a weird way, I mean, it is about the history of art materials, marble having such a big role, and also rocks in painting. So like, I mean, there are moments where you might see like, oh, like how is this connected? But then hopefully as a whole, um, it is just branches of the same concept. Yes, please. Um, can, that brings to mind uh, the relationship between representation and abstraction in your work. Could you talk just a little bit about the, the relationship? Sure. I mean, something that i always been kind of fascinated by is the idea that, you know, you look at minimalism and you look at ab abstract expressionism, which are like, um, I mean, not, not abst geometric, ab I didn't mean abstract, geometric abstraction. And, you know, you have this, like, you know, geometry it has this aura of like, I don't know, the grid, you know, like this, this type of subject matter that's so elevated. And then, and then I think about this room and I look at the grid and I'm like, oh, it's a similar type of grid that I see in the solid you know? So I, I, I was kind of trying to also understand minimalism and, and whether abstraction grows in a vacuum or whether there is a connection to representation. And that's why this piece is true. Um, if you look at the show that's up now, if you look at it from a distance, it might look like a geometric show. It might look like just um, you know, an abstract show. And then 
when you look at it closely, you see that there is actually a very deep subject matter connected to technology, connected to the technology that's in our pockets that we are totally immersed, immersed in. So um, I think that's where like, the representation and subject matter for me is that I don't know where the line is between one and the other. And I just, these are questions that I don't really have answers for, but they, they kind of drive my work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.